All right, uh, part three for inference. Uh, continuing where we picked up last time, let's go back to that thought experiment that we imagine and that gives us the confidence or the sampling distribution of means and confidence intervals. First of all, we need that sampling distribution of means. We collect a sample and we note its mean and its standard deviation. And then we imagine to ourselves, what if we just happen to guess the population mean? What if the population mu mean is actually our sample mean? Um, and so then that lets us imagine the population that our sample came from that has a specific mean and a specific standard deviation. And so far you have to be told what the standard deviation is, and that's all. Uh, later we'll estimate it also. So we imagine zillions and zillions of samples with a sample size n. Now that we've specified the population of raw scores of x, we imagine lots of samples with the same sample size that we used. And this is the sampling distribution of means. And then the mean of that distribution is the same as our population mean. And our population mean, we already imagined that it has a mean that's the same as our sample mean. So the mean of that, popula at that sampling distribution of means is the sample mean. And then we specify the standard deviation of that sampling distribution of means. And we calculate that by dividing the original standard deviation of the original di distribution by the square root of our sample size, the sample size that was used to create all those millions and millions of means. Then we find the middle 95% of that sampling distribution of means. And that's it. And by find the middle 95%, we have to find the two points that cut off the middle 95%, the lower limit and the upper limit. And then our conclusion is usually something like we are 95% confident that the true population mean lies between you know 25.6 and 38.9, or whatever our numbers are. All right, so the assumptions that we make here, the conditions or assumptions for confidence intervals to be accurate by using the normal approximation the way we do, the sample observations need to be independent of each other, and then, okay, this number two basically means the sampling distribution of means needs to be pretty normal. So that can happen a number of ways. Either there, either that raw score distribution can have little or, s or no skew, and we're talking about the sample now, indicating that it's a normal distribution. And also we have a sample size greater than 30, or we have a sample size much greater than 30. The people in this book really don't like the idea of looking at confidence intervals with a sample size less than about 30, although it happens in practice. And the more normal your sample is, or the more you can uh, reasonably assume that the population is normal, the more likely it is that you have an accurate confidence interval. Okay, so the basic principle that we follow in constructing confidence intervals is we have a point estimate. And that point estimate is a sample statistic, plus or minus a margin of error. And that's it. That's a confidence interval. So when you see a poll that says approval rating is 63% plus or minus 2%, it probably means something like 90% confidence interval for that 2%, that 63% is plus or minus 2%, which is one way of expressing a confidence interval. It's talking about the margin of error on either side of the point estimate, which is our sample statistic, usually a sample mean. And the margin of error is always something like a z-score times the standard error. So in this case, it's going to be the z-score that cuts off the middle whatever percent, like 95%, times the standard error of the mean. The statistic in this case is the mean, so standard error of the mean. So confidence interval sizes, can be, we can have a 2% confidence interval or a 100% confidence interval. But in practice, we use 95%, 90%, and 99%. And here's quick formulas. The 90% confidence interval, the formula is easy. You take your sample mean plus and minus 1.65 times the standard error of the mean. And you can calculate the standard error of the mean by taking the sample, the, the population standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of the sample size that this mean came from. So a 90% confidence interval is just the mean plus or minus 1.65 standard errors. 95% is the mean plus or minus uh, 1.96 standard errors. Now keep in mind you're going to have to do two little mathematical procedures, one to find the lower limit, the minus, and one to find the upper, the plus. And then a 99% confidence interval in a normal distribution with z-scores is the mean plus or minus 2.58 standard errors. You can also find a 68% confident confidence interval by just doing the mean plus or minus the standard error, but one standard error because you know that gives you the middle 68%. And sometimes people do that just as a, a quick, sloppy way to check and see how precise their estimate is. It doesn't happen very much in 
in real work though you report 90, 95, or 99, usually 95. So when you're calculating you have three major pieces to keep track of. You need the sample mean, you need the z-score that cuts off one half of the desired area in the tails. So if you have 95% in the middle, a 95% confidence interval, then you know you have 5% in the tails, and because the normal distribution is symmetrical, you'll have half of that 5% in the upper tail and half in the lower, in the lower tail. And so that's what I mean, half of the desired area. Not the desired in the area in the middle, the desired area in the tails. And then you'll have the standard error, or the standard error of the mean. Another way to say this is, it's the sample mean plus or minus the margin of error. Let's look at these pieces again. This is the formula, if you break it down again. Instead of just saying standard error of the mean here, we actually show you the formula for standard error of the mean. The original distribution, standard deviation, the population distribution, divided by the square root of the sample size. And this z is whatever z-score you figured out here. So it's going to be 1.65, or it's going to be 1.96, or it's going to be 2.58. So graphically looking at the parts here, you've got the mean of the population, which happens to be the sample mean too. The standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of this distribution, and this distribution is not the distribution of raw scores. You have to remember, confidence intervals are all about which means you might see, so you need the distribution of all means. That's the sampling distribution of means. So the confidence level is the middle percentage, so 95% confidence level, 90%, 99%. And then you have alpha divided by 2 on either side. Now alpha is the, is the little symbol that we give to the area in the tails. Sometimes there's only one alpha for hypothesis testing, but for confidence intervals there's always two alphas. Well, for our purposes there will always be two two tails, and alpha gets divided in those. So alpha is the area that's not the middle. And so for a confidence interval, we, if you say alpha is 0.05, then the confidence level is 0.95, and that means we have 0.025 here and 0.025 here. So then we have the lower and the upper limits, sometimes um, LL and UL. And then Whatever the distance is from the mean to one of those limits, and it'll be the same on either side, we call that distance the margin of error. We found that margin of error by multiplying the z-score that cuts off this alpha times the standard deviation of this distribution, and then adding it to or subtracting it from the mean. In other words, we're finding a z-score. So that's how we find that. That's, those are the pieces. Now let's look at a few different ways of writing confidence intervals. So the formula as it's written out long ways. And here, um, sometimes we say the confidence interval is our mean plus or minus the margin of error. And in psychology, it's more common to say uh, 95, you, we say the mean and then we say 95% confidence interval. And between curly or square, or sorry, round or square brackets, we will say the lower and the upper limit. Those are all legitimate ways to do things. This isn't a reporting method, this is just the formula. So that's the standard error of the mean, sigma divided by the square root of n. That's the alpha level. So when we say z, alpha slash 2, it means z for the alpha divided by 2. So z that cuts off 0.025 in one tail, or for a 90% confidence interval, z that cuts off 0.05 in one tail. 99% confidence interval, z that cuts off 0.005. Don't go dividing z by 2 or anything like that. Z, everything in the subscript just tells you what kind of z it is. So alpha divided by 2. It's the z for half of alpha. So that's the alpha level represented there. The confidence level itself is always the inverse of alpha. It's the complement of alpha. So 1 minus alpha is the confidence level. 1 minus the confidence level is always alpha. Because one is the tails and the other one is everything else, the middle. And then you have the confidence limits, the lower limit and the upper limit. When you put the, um, the z-score and the SEM together and you multiply them, then you get the margin of error. And then when you both add that and subtract that from the mean, then you have the whole confidence interval. So it's a two or three step process to get this. So interpreting confidence intervals, there's kind of a standard way to do this. You uh, will say something like, blah, 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 the mean was this with a 95% confidence interval of this. Or you can save words and make it even shorter. And when you're trying to publish a paper, you always need to sa save words. The standard technical interpretation is a bit long. We can say, oh, sorry, 
the more specific technical interpretation belong. This is the short version. We, we often say, if somebody asks us to interpret the confidence interval, and you can do this if you're asked to interpret one, you can say, we can be 95% confident, or we are 95% confident, that the, that the true population mean, that, that mu, whatever, they phrased it here as the mean of all insult latencies, lies between 2.28 and 2.88 seconds. That word confident is pretty wishy-washy, but that's an important wishy-washy to keep us from writing a big, ridiculously long sentence all the time. You'll see some other formats, and there's no one method that's always exactly right. It sort of depends on context and prior research. So when you're interpreting the meaning of confidence intervals, which is poorly capitalized here, try and remember to ask yourself, is, what does this mean? How does, why did I do this? What's the point that I have these numbers? Well, usually you're comparing it to something else. You're comparing it to confidence intervals found in some other studies with similar methods and similar variables and things like this. Or sometimes you're wondering if it contains some meaningful value or clearly does not contain some meaningful value of some kind. And so when you're interpreting confidence intervals, you're very interested in making some sort of real sense to it. Now, often you have a hypothesis and then the confidence interval supports or fails to support your hypothesis. It confirms or disconfirms your hypothesis. So does the confidence interval conform to this hypothesis that you have? Does it tell you anything about it? And then the last thing, always a good idea, is it plausible? Does it make any sense? Do these numbers make any kind of sense? And as you go along, you learn more and more about what's plausible, that you know, if the numbers are not on either side of a mean, then you've made some calculation error. For instance, if they're crazy, insane numbers, then maybe you need some calculation error. All right, I'm going to stop there for right now, make this a really brief video.